Good evening and welcome to the edit. My name's Matilda Morozzi. I'm a board member at the Melbourne Press Club and a radio producer and journalist at the ABC. Thanks so much for taking out some time this evening to join the Melbourne Press Club's US election event. Really glad you could make it. We're here to learn about how we as journalists can pass on stories to our communities. And that's something the Indigenous people have been doing on this land for generations. Uh, I'm currently joining you from the city of Maribyrnong, which was a significant meeting place for the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung and the Boonwurrung peoples of the Kulin Nation. I'd like to start by acknowledging their elders past, present and emerging. Um, since I've moved to this area, I've actually learned that Maribyrnong is an anglicised term that means I can hear a ringtail possum. So whether you can hear ringtail possums or not tonight, I'd like to thank you for coming. Um, I'm really thrilled to be joined by Channel 7's Mike Amor, who has extensive experience covering the US as Channel 7's correspondent in, in America, and Ebony Bowden. She's originally from Melbourne, but is now working covering Washington for the New York Post, which is a Murdoch, Murdoch tabloid over in the US. Um, if you haven't been to an EDIT event before, the EDIT is the Melbourne Press Club's program for students and early career journalists. We're supported by the Copyright Agency Cultural Fund. Uh, it's a space where you can learn new skills, ask questions about people who have some experience and to meet your future colleagues and maybe your future employers. Uh, before we get started, an important piece of housekeeping. Entries for the Melbourne Press Club 2020 Student Journalist of the Year Award are open until the 7th of January, 2021. The Student of the Year Award recognises the best in Victorian journalism, and it's supported this year by the Judith Nielsen Institute for Journalism and Ideas. Enrolled student journalists are encouraged to enter a piece of journalism in any media that is made available to the general public in Victoria during the 2020 calendar year. We encourage entries from all Victorian student journalists including you if you are of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander descent or from a culturally and linguistically diverse background. Uh, we want our entrants to represent the wonderfully diverse population we have in this state. So if you've got something that you're proud of that you've produced in the calendar 2020 year, get it in to us by the 7th of January 2021. Um, pandemic permitting, the prize is really fantastic. The winner gets a trip to the United States to attend the Investigative Reporters and Editors Conference in June 2021. Winners also receive a thousand dollar cash prize and a free year membership with the Melbourne Press Club. Um, I was lucky enough to go to the IRE conference last year and it was a really great experience. If you have any questions about IRE um, or how to apply, you can feel free to contact me on Twitter or there's some details in the chat. Um, you can go to our edit website for entry. Uh, throughout tonight's Zoom, please feel free to put questions to Mike using the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom panel. I'll raise them with Mike throughout the night. Um, and if you want to practice how to use the Q&A function, you, you can feel free to introduce yourself, uh, put your name in the chat and tell me a bit about where you're working or studying at the moment. But the reason he is not to listen to me right on, it's to meet Mike Amor. Uh, he is currently a news presenter for Channel 7 in Melbourne, having returned in 2018 from the US after reporting there for over 18 years. Mike has covered many of the stories that have defined the US and the world in recent years, including the September 11 attack in New York, Hurricane Katrina, wars and mass shootings. He has won a slew of Australian and US journalism awards and has covered five US elections, which he'll be talking to us about extensively tonight. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. You make me feel really old, Matilda, thank you. <laughs> Experience, I think, is a better way. <laughs> or I'll go with experience. <laughs> um, can you tell me about the first US election you covered? Well, it was just after I went to um, America. I covered the Sydney Olympics and a week later found myself uh, jetting off to LA. Um, I'd been to America. My mum had lived in America uh, for about five years. So I knew a bit about America, but I, I had an interest in American politics, but I wouldn't say it ran to any great depth. I don't think I knew anything about the Electoral College or anything like that. So I was in, I got there maybe early October. Um, my predecessor had left under difficult circumstances, so really didn't set much up for me. And I was panicked. It all of a sudden occurred to me there's a, an election on, Bush v Gore. And I said to them, guys, I, what am I going to do? And they go, oh, mate, don't worry about it. It'll last a day. It'll go and disappear. 
well, if you're in your 20s, you probably don't remember, but Bush v. Gore um, a very was close one of the. Election, wasn't it? it was, it couldn't be closer. Um, so come election night, um, Gore actually conceded to, to George W. Bush. Um, and as George W. Bush was driving to make his acceptance speech, Gore um, rang him and, and um, withdrew his concession. Um, all the networks in America had called it for, for George W. Bush. And it turned out that the votes in Florida, which is a key state to deciding the US election, were so close that it would automatically triggered a recount. Um, and this thing called Hanging Chads, um, famous video of people looking at these chads. And chads were, they used hole punches to, to, uh, in, on ballots to punch their choice. And if you didn't punch it hard enough, it left a hanging chad, a little piece of paper. And technically that wasn't a correct vote, but they decided they'd go back and, and count these hanging chads. Well, this went on for weeks weeks and weeks. It ended up being decided by the US Supreme Court, I think on December 12, so the election's early November, so think about that, six weeks of it. And um, it, uh, the Supreme Court at that stage made a ruling five to four in favour of George W. Bush to stop the recount. It turned out at that stage he'd won by 500 votes. Consider that, 500 votes and I think 50 million people who'd voted for either side. Um, there's a lot of thought that perhaps the US Supreme Court, which was heavily weighted conservative, and remember that because that's an important thing looking at this year, perhaps called it too early in that if um, had it gone to a statewide vote that um, Al Gore may have ended up winning the election. But go back to me, and this boy from Bendigo just landed green um, in the US and was told that this election was going to last a week. Well, it ended up lasting much longer than that. And Oh, that just, I think, started to fuel my interest in the US, um, US politics, US election. Um, I, I just found it fascinating. I, I don't have, I don't have a political science degree. I don't have an American political degree, or, 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 or history in American politics or, or history. But um, I love the theatre of American politics, and I, and you, in American politics, especially now, you see the value of journalism, um, which I. I loved and fell in love with it. So that was number one. What would you say is the value of journalism that the US elections bring out? Oh, I think, I think what, the one thing that Donald Trump has done is given renewed energy and relevance to mainstream media. You know, you see the likes of the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, all right, they're all liberal, um, but they are fighting the fight. Um, and it's become very partisan, admittedly, but they are, as my old journalist um, mentors used to say, we're keeping the bastards honest. And, and, and I even think, think we're seeing it now here, um, a, again, very divided, bitterly divided what's going on in Victoria, but journalism is really keeping people honest. We don't even have to see the reporting that The Age has done that to, to uncover what Brett Sutton is now facing um, that would have gone unnoticed apart from great journalism. So... I quickly learned the value of, um, and, and, you know, I was watching it from a spectator, really a spectator point of view, because the Channel 7 audience, they were interested in the theatrics more than, the, you know, the politics. Um, but it's, it's very easy to get, to get um, I guess, washed away in the, in the minutiae of American politics and, and the, the way they examine every little bit of it still. Um, I'm not as heavily involved in it or watching it, but I still watch it regularly. My wife obviously is American. Um, it's a hot topic conversation. But again, that was number one. I, I, I ended up you know, going on to, to cover four more and, and each of them had their, had their int interesting parts of it. In 2000, when you initially went over, what was the appetite for US politics like in Australia? Uh, Matilda, it's interesting because not only US politics, but we kind of waned on America in general. Uh, I, when I went over, um, our bureau had just gone from two reporters, an editor and two cameramen back to myself and one, one cameraman and questions over whether we'd even last. Um, so we kind of pulled away from that. And, and to be honest, that first it's year... That you wouldn't have a US bureau, don't you think? It, it, was a, it was a real possibility. I was told it was a possibility. Um, and the bean counters had come in and 
I think, you know, Channel 7 may have been going through a rough patch. Um, and so we were one cameraman, one journo covering all of America and, and beyond, really. Um, and that first year, I've got to say, was pretty quiet. I mean, it, and we didn't cover, while we covered the American politics, we didn't travel for debates initially. We didn't. Um, I know for a fact that we're covering the third debate live. We're going to take it live. We didn't, we didn't have that appetite for it back then. Um, and then that first year come and went and uh, September uh, 2001 rolled around and that, that really changed um, America's, well, the Australians' appetite for American news. September 11, um, can you tell me where you were that day? Yeah, I'd been in New York to cover Leighton Hewitt. He'd won the US Open that weekend. Um, and I've got to be honest, we'd had a big night out on that um, night because Leighton had he'd been difficult to deal with um, and he'd gone home. So we were all celebrating the fact that he'd gone and we were, we were finished. And I had uh, a bit bleary-eyed. I, I um, jumped into a cab at 8 o'clock that morning, thereabouts, in New York, in Manhattan, with my cameraman. And um, we had an Israeli taxi driver. I know that because he drove past the Israeli mission and um, he thought we were tourists. And he said, oh, there's always a police car sitting out the front of the Israeli mission. And it's just as you turn around, you go into one of the tunnels leading out of Manhattan towards JFK, the airport. And as soon as he said that, the, the um, police car just lights and sirens, just poof. And he goes, hmm, that's unusual. Uh, we went out in, into the tunnel and came back out, out and the whole world had changed because obviously, you know, it had happened. The first first plane had struck and every emergency vehicle um, seemingly in Manhattan and beyond was going in the other direction back into the tunnel. And my phone rang and um, it was a producer at night um, in, in Australia and said uh, a plane had hit the World Trade Centre and... I couldn't believe it, but it was a beautiful blue sky. If anyone's been to New York in, in September, it's just it's great weather. I looked in the back of the taxi cab through the back window and almost framed it perfectly. There was the, the tower with a big hole in it and just, yeah, and that was it. You know, And the taxi driver started crying hysterically, slamming his, his um, hand on the steering wheel saying things like, you know, they've got us here, they've got us here. And we just say, sorry, mate, but we, we need to get around. And they started closing down all the bridges and tunnels into Manhattan. And we luckily snuck in before they closed the last one and, and made our way down to, um, to ground zero, what became ground zero. Um, and in the, in the meantime, the second plane had struck and we were listening to the radio and it sounded like War of the Worlds. Um, you know, there, there, was, there was a lot of false reports, but in the middle of it was, you know, a plane had struck the Pentagon. It's, a plane had gone down in a field in Pennsylvania. A bomb had gone off at the US Supreme Court. Not true. There was a plane heading towards the White House, which was true. It was a plane in Pennsylvania. So it was crazy. And that really shaped what happened after that. I remember those images coming through, uh, you know, interrupted all the, the television that was on. Uh, mm. But I, I can't quite remember, was it live? Was, was that some an event where you had to be constantly doing live crosses and updating the audience or were we not quite there as a profession yet no we weren't there um certainly weren't there um from a, a digital kind of perspective from a, a technical perspective we weren't there um we the, the, the towers had come down by the time i made it down I, they'd literally had just come down you could see people coming running up the street you know those classic um, that classic vision of people covered in dust. Um, and it was just panic. You know, I set, remember seeing an FBI agent directing traffic. traffic and, and FBI agents don't direct traffic, but you just had this absolute fear on his face. We got down there, we got close, and, um, yeah, it's, it, it's difficult to, it, to probably younger people to understand, but the cell towers for all of Manhattan, Effectively, we're on top of the World Trade Center tower, wow. so it went down, and effectively, so did self service. So it was very, very hard to get a phone call out, let alone 
get, was all satellite back then, get a loan, get, get your own satellite space because the Americans were going wall to wall to wall. Um, so that was the, the logistic, as, is, as has always been in the job of a correspondent, logistics is often the biggest challenge you face. It's, covering the story is often the easy part, but certainly September 11 was very, very difficult. I think, you know, luckily I think we were the first to get to where from an, from an Australian perspective, and obviously we went wall to wall, um, but we certainly, you know, didn't have carte blanche on, on uh, TV time. And the September 11, you mentioned changed mm. almost everything, not just in the US, but internationally, there was huge changes after that event. Um, but politically in the US, what do you think has been the legacy of that day? Well, I think, well, remember, we, we, that launched into two wars, one that went for, what, 13 years, and, and we still got troops on the ground in Afghanistan. Um, I think um, Americans naturally kind of became very protective um, all of a sudden. They'd been attacked on their home soil. It hadn't really happened since Pearl Harbour. Um, and I think, you know, all of a sudden, we, when we're seeing a bit of this now is this, you know, America first, America first, America first. We don't care about the rest of the world. We're not, we don't want to be the world's policeman. Um, and that fueled that wave, wave of nationalism um, and, and, you know, fear of foreigners. You know, we saw uh, um, the Muslim community treated very poorly in the aftermath of, of that. Um, and, you know, and George Bush going to war in, in Iraq for nothing, effectively, um, and still getting elected um, four years on, um, despite the fact that they were at war and, um, and it was costing the American uh, people a lot of money and, and lives. And, and it also fueled, you know, retaliatory um, terrorism attacks that were felt during the Obama period, um, you know, the Boston bombing. Uh, Americans felt very unsafe. Uh, if you're just joining us, my name's Matilda Morozzi. I'm a producer with the ABC and also on the board of the Melbourne Press Club. Our guest is Mike Amor. He's with Channel 7 News and spent 18 years in the US as Channel 7's correspondent and bureau chief. Uh, we're talking about the US election and how to cover them. 2008, um, Barack Obama and John McCain are going against each other. Can you tell me your strongest memories of covering that election? Yeah, it was, it was hard not to get caught up in Barack Obama. I'd seen Barack Obama, by the way, 2004 um, at John Kerry's um, convention in Boston. He was a, uh, an Illinois state senator at that stage and he spoke on the first night and he kind of blew the doors off everybody. He, he wasn't known. He, he was tagged as a future presidential candidate, but, you know, he's going to need some time to develop. He, he's... He was already an, an incredible orator at that stage and obviously John Kerry went on to, to lose to George W. Bush. Four years later, um, Barack Obama uh, was then only, had only just become a, a US senator. Um, and I think Americans were tired. They were tired of war. And they wanted something different and they were caught up in, in um, the, the spirit of, um, you know, he had his yes, we can slogan and it was and John McCain by the way a great American um, would have been a great president he was just blown away by a young um, man who who really caught um, caught on in the in the electorate and particularly among African Americans but I just remember the enthusiasm and excitement I went to I don't know we'd go to two probably of his rallies every day um, we tried to get one for the morning um, to, to be live for sunrise and then one for our six o'clock news. And so he, it, the excitement, he was making the same speech over and over again as they do, but the excitement was, it was, it was hard not to get caught up with it. And, and um, he, he, he was, he, it was incredible to be part of that or at least not be part of it, at least witness it. And I also remember being in Grant Park in Chicago the night of the election um, when he won. And it was a beautiful night. November in Chicago is really a beautiful night. 
and we were in this big stand um, which was kind of creaking under the weight of hundreds of journalists, so, so much so that um, if you wanted to get to your live shot, you had to crawl behind the journalists or in front of them to get to your live spot because there's literally no and, – and journalists were standing shoulder to shoulder. So you'll be doing a live shot and you've got journos going – if crawling in front of you and crawling behind you, but it was just electric. Um, now, whether Barack Obama lived up to the hype, I don't, I don't know. History will tell you, but um, it, it was an incredible election campaign. You know, American politics has always been theatrical, as I've mm-hmm. said a few times, but I think no more so than the last term and, and the current president. <laughs> When you first heard that then reality TV star and, um, you know, property mogul Donald Trump was putting his hand up for presidency, what did you think? Because most people um, didn't take it seriously. Oh, I didn't. Um, in fact, Sunrise, you know, they wanted me to do something and I said, oh, this guy's a joke. It's not going to, you know, he's a reality TV star. I'll be honest. Um, he's not going to last. There were some really good candidates, Jeb Bush, um, John Kasich, in, in, in the field of 17 at that stage. So I, you know, I, I underestimated him straight away. Um, I think they did too, by the way. Um, yeah, and I certainly didn't think he was going to win. I, um, he, in the same way, but probably the opposite end of the scale, latched on to that kind of sentiment um, that Barack Obama did to the left, Trump did to the right. Um, that Donald, uh, that... Um, they call it the white lash. You know, the, a lot of white middle-aged, mainly men in the, in the Midwest, were, you know, they, they, they wanted the return to what they thought was normal politics, and that was Donald Trump. They loved the fact that he, he wasn't politically correct. Uh, they loved the fact that he was trying to get, the, you know, the Mexican government to pay for the, the wall and all of those things. He, you know, he appealed to the base, and I... Still to the end, I didn't, I didn't see it coming, um, which is another lesson for what we're about to go through. Uh, I want to take you back to January 20, 2017, and you, that's the day Trump was inaugurated. Mm-hmm. You were there, uh, and in your piece to camera to Australians, you said then that America was bitterly divided. And mm-hmm. I just wonder, at the end of Donald Trump's term, do you think it's more or less divided now than it was in 2017? No, it's more divided. It's totally, totally more divided. There's anger. Look, you know what? One of the things I loved about American politics is Australians are taught not to talk about religion and politics. It's the opposite in America. You know, you talk about politics like it's your, like it's your football team. My, my father-in-law, who's a smart college-educated man, not necessarily the right demographic for Donald Trump, but he, he's a staunch Republican. He hated Barack Obama. He's a, he's a supporter of Donald Trump. But you would spend hours debating with him about you know, whatever the politics of the day was. But always good-hearted, fun, generally done over a few wines. But that, not, not, not with my father-in-law, but it's become so bitter and so angry. And we're seeing, it, seeing some of this in, the, in the Victoria right now, you know, that you, can, you just can't have a difference of opinion or a difference of politics without making it personal, without making an attack. And, and the left is as guilty sometimes as the right, but Donald Trump has really appealed to that base. You know, the fact now that he's, he's you know, lock up Joe Biden. This is an old play from the Hillary Clinton time that his, his, you know, his base just laps up. Um, no, it's more divided than it ever has been. And I think you see that in, in you know, the riots that we saw, you know, a couple of months ago. Um, remember, if you've got a question for Mike, uh, please put it in the chat. Make button. it easy. <laughs> I'll try and ask him. Yeah, it saves me doing it. Um, <laughs> I just want, uh, Christians sent something through asking if you think uh, Trump's been affected by his COVID treatment, will he be able to do the next debate? Yeah, I, Christian, it's interesting because I saw that speculation that um, his moods had been affected had, as a side effect of, of those experimental drugs. We just don't know. And that's the, that's the thing with Donald Trump. Normally, presidents are, are very um, forthright with their information about their health because obviously they lead the country, they're the leader of the free world. We just don't know with Donald Trump. But, yes, I think he will. Um, I think he's perfectly healthy to do 
the debate. The key for him is he doesn't like the fact that they're going to turn the mics off so he can't interrupt Joe Biden. That's his go-to plan. Whether or not he, at the end of the day, he uses that as an excuse not to um, um, debate Joe Biden. It's going to be interesting. But he needs to land some big hits right now. So I, I think it's, there's every likelihood he will be fronting Joe Biden. Uh, he certainly doesn't like the fact that he won't be in control of who speaks when. There's another question asking um, why the Demo Democrats couldn't find anyone better than Biden. Do you think he's a good candidate? Oh, oh look, I think no. <laughs> I think I think it's probably a sad state of affairs for the Democrat Party that this is Joe Biden had to turn to a what a 78 year old man who's I think he's his fourth run. Um, he's 74 it, and Biden is 78, which I it's find crazy, it's right? Extraordinary. Because yeah. most people are retiring at that age and, and these men are putting their hands up for one of the toughest jobs in the world. Well, you know, I'm 52. That's still young in America. Um, I think it's pretty old probably in Australia. But, I, it, yeah, I, look, I think it's a sad, sad state of affairs that they couldn't find another candidate. Um, he's a safe option. Um, and, uh, he's obviously going to be the stopgap president if he... If he wins, I don't, can't imagine that he would be um, able to stand again. So it's probably um, going to be Kamala Harris um, to be able to prove her worth to run possibly against Pence if, if Trump loses. But, yeah, I think he's the candidate they had to have when they couldn't find another one. Yeah. The polling at the moment is, is showing... Um, Biden at 51% and uh, Trump at 42%. Can we, should we even bother looking at them? Uh, I, I think we should be all suspicious of polling after 2016 and also what happened in the federal election in Australia. Um, I, I think uh, what happened in 2016, you'd be saying right now that Biden's, it's going to be a, a you know, it's going to be a whitewash. It's going, Biden will win and win handsomely, but I don't believe in the polls anymore. Um, uh, and you also got to understand the system in America. It's, it's about the electoral college. It's not about the popular vote. Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by 3 million, still lost the electoral college. It gets back to those, that kind of the old blue wall that Hillary Clinton lost, you know, the, the Michigans and, and Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, that she lost back then. He's, uh, Biden's in front in a lot of those places. Interestingly enough, he's also places like Arizona normally a very um, red state, very Republican state, and now leaning towards Joe Biden. He starts picking out some of those states as well. It's, it, it's all over, um, even though it's still pretty close in pl places like um, Florida. And I don't think a Republican has ever won the White House without winning Florida. So uh, another, uh, I also point out to Matilda that um, 2016, we had Hillary Clinton's FBI investigation reopen right at the death knell. I think Hillary Clinton would have won that year, but but for that. So there's a lot to play out in 14 days and, you know, who knows in American politics, especially right now. Uh, one last question before we head over to uh, the US where I've spoken to Ebony Bowden earlier this week about what it's like on the campaign trail currently. Um, but I've heard it quoted that Trump has changed the presidency more than the presidency has changed Trump. I uh, just wonder what you think of that statement and if you think if Trump wasn't re-elected, would there be a lasting impact you'd see on, on the actual office from his term? Yeah, he's changed a lot of traditions with the presidency from the daily briefings, which are not daily anymore, to, to showing his, his uh, medical advice to sh declaring his tax returns, which, you know, big controversy over there. I think there's certainly some prestige taken out of the office um, that maybe somebody of the generation of Joe Biden, who, who would be a traditionalist, would probably try to restore. But also um, the international standing of the American presidency um, has also diminished um, under Donald Trump. I don't think anyone could argue. He's, you know, he's argued with allies and held meetings with, you know, dictators. Um, so, yeah, maybe, maybe it has changed. Look, and, and, you know, Donald Trump has also taken, the, you know, the political correctness out, that, out of politics, which to an extent is probably not a bad thing. He certainly pushed it to the, to, as far as he possibly could. Um, but, um, yeah, I guess we have to wait and see see 
whether the presidency becomes more traditional. <laughs> it's not a traditional presidency, not at all. Um, thanks, Mike. We'll be back with you shortly. So if you have a question for Mike, please, now is a great time to put it in the Q&A and I'll try and get to as many of your questions for Mike as I can after we hear from Ebony. Um, Ebony's originally from Melbourne but now works as a, the New York Post's Washington correspondent. She's covering the White House and the 2020 presidential election. Previously, you might have seen her work as a breaking news reporter at The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald or even before that, The New Daily. Um, I started by asking her where she was joining us from. So I'm somewhere in Florida um, and I have been, so I'm on the campaign trail for the New York Post. So I'm covering both the Biden and the Trump campaign. Obviously we are 17 days until the election. So um, traveling all over the country, I've been going to the debates. So I was in Cleveland, Ohio a few weeks ago. Um, so just traveling all over the country and um, yeah, having a lot of fun. And, and you're a Melbourne girl. Can you tell me a bit about how you've ended up covering the 2020 US election for an American outlet? Look, I mean, it's a, it's a long story, Matilda. It's kind of um, a dream come true, really. I never, ever thought, you know, um, as a young reporter that I would actually have this incredible opportunity. So I used to work for The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald in Australia. And I worked there for a few years as a breaking news reporter and as a media reporter. And I uh, went to the US on vacation and kind of fell in love with America instantly and was like, okay, I need to come here and work as a journalist. So cut a long story short, I um, told my bosses at The Age that I um, was quitting and I, I kind of, I was like, okay, I'm gonna move to America, I'm gonna move to New York and I kind of announced it to all my friends and my network, which was something that was really handy. Um, I didn't know anyone in America, didn't have any friends, didn't have a job lined up. I just kind of took this crazy wild risk and went with my gut. You know, I knew that it was gonna take me a few months to find work in America and I was prepared for that and I had savings. I didn't realize how long it was gonna take me. I mean, um, obviously the Australian media market is incredibly competitive, but the US is 10 times more so. And when you're coming from a foreign country and you don't really have any experience, you're competing with American journalists who've already interned at these publications. Um, it took me nearly a year to find a job in America. After about nine months, uh, I applied for a job at the New York Post, which you know is such an incredible publication. It's brand is well known around the world um, and obviously that's owned by Rupert Murdoch and there were a few Australian they already had a few Australians working there um, I applied and I submitted some clips of my work and I finally got a call back and I met the editors and they loved me we just had that real cultural fit you know that no-nonsense Australian kind of way they're totally the same and um, I got the job and they hired me and I really couldn't believe it Election year is an interesting time to start a new beat in politics, particularly when the whole world seems to be watching this election. I understand mm -hmm. you've actually been in the Oval Office and interviewed President Trump. Can you tell me a bit about that experience, what you did to prepare and how you felt walking into the Oval Office that we've seen, you know, all these depictions of throughout our yeah. whole upbringing? Yeah, look, it's such a good question, Matilda. I've actually had the incredible opportunity to interview the president in the Oval Office twice. Um, nothing can prepare you for that moment. You know, um, as you said, we've seen it depicted so many times and you walk into that room and um, the one way that I would describe it is it's like being in a movie set, you know, um, and it's made it all the weirder by, you know, coronavirus. You have to get a coronavirus test before you're in the room with the president um, and you're kind of ushered through the West Wing and there's Secret Service guys everywhere and um, you're waiting for him and he's the busiest man in the world so often you're waiting you know he's running a few hours late and you're nervous and you're sitting there and you're you know you're sweating and you're looking at your questions and you're and you're waiting and then um, you get called into the Oval Office and it's such a beautiful room and you know we've all seen it a million times before but you walk in there and you feel like you're on a movie set you know um, and you're you're trying to take in all the details of the room but you know, the President of the United States is sitting there and he's waiting to talk to you. And so it's, it's just, it's the most incredible experience. Um, 
as for preparing to interview someone like President Trump, look, it, it's it's difficult because not only is he incredibly accessible, um, that's something that I will say about the president. He does constant briefings. He's constantly talking to reporters. So you have to think of things that he hasn't been asked before. And you also need to understand that if he doesn't like a question, he's not going to answer it. Um, I remember that this was at the peak of the pandemic. So this was um, May, I think I first interviewed um, President Trump. And people had been trying to push him repeatedly on testing. Testing here has been really difficult. And um, some of the best reporters in the world, far better than I, you know, your Maggie Habermans and your Jim Acosta's have been constantly asking him, you said everyone could get a test back in April, you know, or, or March, it's now May, we know that there are huge testing delays. And he just would defer. And I mean, Trump is so savvy and so clever. Um, he just won't answer it. And so I didn't want to waste my time you know, I had precious time with him. So I really tried to ask policy questions and questions that he hadn't been asked before, but also ask questions that would get him talking on an emotional level. I really, I think Trump's such a complex character that I really wanted to kind of get an idea of his psyche. I asked him about his legacy and what he would be most proud of. Um, I think, you know, when you're interviewing someone who's really important, you have to look at how they've asked and answered how they've answered past questions. So you, you know how they're going to respond and you're not going over the same ground. You spoke a little bit there about how the New York Post is a tabloid, uh, mm -hmm. a Murdoch tabloid, some, similar to the Herald Sun or, or the Daily Telegraph. But it's it takes tabloid to a new level that we don't really see yeah. in Australia. It, how do you describe the newspaper? Because um, it's a huge contrast from what you were publishing work for the age over here. Look, that's a really good question. Um, the way that I would describe the New York Post for Australian viewers is, you know, the NT Times, how they do those crazy front pages. You know, the Post is really well known for its incredible headlines and front pages. I I am very proud of the work that I've done in both publications. You know, um, you think about something like The Age and they do a lot of social justice issues. Um, I really enjoy how irreverent the New York Post is. Um, I really enjoy how much the publication snubs its nose at authority and the establishment and is not afraid to publish things that other people won't. Um, and of course, we're conservative and we um, definitely um, skew more towards Trump than I think the New York Times and other publications do. But we um, do a lot of, I've done a lot of work that I'm really proud of and um, I do enjoy like I said, how irreverent the publication is and that we are not afraid to publish things because it's not politically correct. I think that a lot of media um, is very quick to kind of um, fall in step with social movements or kind of capitulate to backlash. And I've enjoyed working for somewhere like The Post because it's not afraid to say things that may be unpopular um, but may still be right or have some truth to them. Um, I've really appreciated that. You spoke about the, the New York Post being willing to publish some things that aren't popular. And obviously, um, over the weekend, there's been this story that the New York Post has published about yeah. Hunter Biden, which has seen your Twitter account, the New York Post Twitter account temporarily suspended. And the, the Post, um, I don't know how Facebook are describing it, but it's, it's not as accessible to see the story on Facebook. Uh, yeah. Can you, but for people who might have missed it, can you tell us? a bit about what the Hunter Biden story is and how you've ended up being coming a story rather than people just reading what you've published. Yeah, so this wasn't a story that I had a lot of involvement in. Um, my colleagues in New York really handled this. Um, but yeah, really interesting story. Um, Hunter Biden, Joe Biden's son, um, allegedly left uh, a computer of his, a laptop at a... Um, computer repair shop in Wilmington, Delaware, where the Bidens are from. He never collected it. Um, the computer repair man, I think it was lost property. So he opened it up and started looking into it and found a, a tranche of documents, including um, emails that Hunter Biden had sent um, his associates in Ukraine and China while his dad was vice president, personal emails, family photos, things like that, text messages. Um, and some of the things that were found on the hard drive um, that Hunter Biden allegedly sent um, included, um, you know, evidence that Hunter Biden was brokering meetings between his father and Ukrainian gas executives who were under investigation at the time. All this was supposedly happening while um, 
Joe Biden was the vice president. So um, we got given this hard drive and um, we published everything. Um, the Biden campaign came out and didn't say that the emails were fake, but said that, you know, meetings between the Bidens and these gas executives in Ukraine who were corrupt, never happened, whatever. Um, the hard drive came to us through um, an attorney for President Trump, Rudy Giuliani. Um, and so immediately everyone said that this was disinformation from Russia and it was all fake. Um, and so Twitter immediately um, locked our Twitter account tried to, they actually blocked people from sharing this article. Um, and the New York Post's Twitter account has been locked for the last four days. It's kind of full circle from 2016, where there was a lot of criticism of social media for not um, intervening and not fa failing to stop the spread of fake news, so-called. Um, and now it looks like, like, okay, we're not gonna do the same as 2016, but potentially the ledges swung too far the other way that, uh, you know, yeah. a newspaper that's well known, that has journalists. It's not like it, New York Post is some small publisher with people mm -hmm. not checking the facts of their articles. And yeah, look, I mean, we, I mean, the reporters who worked on this, did all of their research, you know, all the research possible, and um, they worked on this for weeks. And we had some of the best reporters in the organization working on this, um, award-winning reporters. Um, you know, look. Twitter and Facebook are in an unenviable position, right? Um, like you said, Matilda, they didn't insert themselves enough. You know, maybe they've acted too quickly. I wouldn't want to be Mark Zuckerberg or Jack Dorsey at the moment. Thank you so much for taking some of your time out of a busy schedule. I know it must be nonstop work in the lead up to the polls on November. Yes. <laughs> Just one final question. Have you got a highlight so far from your time covering US politics? Oh, gosh, I think definitely having the opportunity to spend an hour with um, the president. Um, this is a man that we all know, um, and I think we all have feelings of him, but being able to spend um, an hour with him and get to know him and um, how flawed he is and, and, and some interesting redeeming qualities that he has and, and have that time with him. I mean, this is the most famous talked about man in the world and i am so um grateful to have had the, that opportunity to sit and speak with him that so many of my peers in the white house press corps have never had and i really look forward to um i think telling my children um about that because i think like nixon like other past great presidents um i think donald trump is going to live in our memories so there you go that was ebony bowden joining us from Florida. She's on the US election campaign trail uh, covering Donald Trump and um, Joe Biden. So he's been traveling all around the country there trying to uh, cover the election campaign and New York Post making themselves news um, in the middle of, of the campaign trail. Uh, I wonder, Mike, listening to that, did that make you miss the campaign trail? Did you feel like you wanted to be out there a bit? No, I'm missing it. Uh, I would love to be over there. Um, unfortunately, you know, with the way things are with coronavirus, I couldn't go, but I, I would love to be there. I, it's certainly one of the great things I've done. Um, and listening to the access that Ebony has, I'm, I'm very jealous. Um, of course, we, we didn't have that kind of access, but uh, so we were kind of watching from the sidelines to, to a certain degree. I was lucky enough to... Um, to go to the, the Western White House, as it called, was called then George Bush's ranch in Texas uh, with John Howard. Um, and, you know, whatever you think of their politics, these people are incredibly charismatic. George Bush was like a rock star to be around um, compared to John Howard. Um, <laughs> and it was that famous, you know, that famous... Um, line that George Bush said that day was, he was, what was it? Um, I was puffing when I was walking with John Howard and Barney, his dog was puffing even harder. He's, did he say he's like a Superman of, you know, so, it, you know, that they are really um, rock star politicians. And I, I, I certainly didn't have the access that Ebony had, but I, I was also with um, Malcolm Turnbull when he met um, Donald Trump uh, on the air, retired aircraft carrier in, in New York City. We got to throw a couple of questions at it. And that, that's a real highlight because these guys, they're, 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 whatever, again, whatever their politics, um, 
they are smart people and very good at what they do and how they respond um, to people's questions, whether you believe them, whether they're right, whether they're lying, whatever you want, but they are great performers. Um, Ebony is working for a local newspaper and, you know, the New York Post knows its audience and Mm -hmm. it's writing for them. But I wonder, as a foreign correspondent, what do you think your job is when you're covering an overseas election because you're not informing people to vote? No, we're not. And, and you know, the truth is you, you're trying to both um, capture the political theatre because you're not delving into the politics because my, my dad and mum here in Melbourne and Bendigo, they don't care about the, the politics, the minutiae that the Americans get into. And I think, I think Americans are largely a lot more aware of um, politics um, than, than Australians, which is kind of crazy to say given that I think you know, the, the voting rates in the 50% because it's not compulsory there, obviously. Mm. Um, but you try, you try to stay um, neutral and it's hard to see when the theatrics that Trump has, has done, but you also try to tell the truth. I mean, I, I, I just, just uh, one of my great regrets was covering Colin Powell at the UN General Assembly um, when they were trying to mount the argument to, to be able to go to war with um, Iraq and they were trying to say that Iraq has um, nuclear weapons and they were showing the satellite pictures. And, and I reported it probably in my um, in memory too much as fact that it was fact when it really wasn't fact. It was later disproved that it was wrong. Um, so I, that was a great was lesson for me. Um, it was very interesting how that's changed. Because of mm. Donald Trump, he's probably made us better journalists. But when he oh, definitely. first tweeted that he had been diagnosed with COVID-19, um, it was reported as the president says he has yeah. been diagnosed or it's on his Twitter. Well, re- it wasn't reported initially as fact. Well, there is a, some a suspicion about what Donald Trump says and whether it's true or not. But I think it's important that, um, you, that yeah, you do report it as, uh, um, uh, as Donald Trump says or the White House says or, um, you know, Colin Powell is claiming to the UN General Assembly um, because it, obviously, um, you know, it's, you can take it back to politics here, um, um, Brett Sutton says, because all these things could be over time be proven to be incorrect through whether it was a mistake or, or otherwise. Um, and I, I, I agree with you, Matilda. I think it's made us, certainly in the mainstream, a lot more responsible because if we get it wrong, that Twitter machine, it lights up and, it, and it's brutal. Mm-hmm. Um, and we are held to account. The fake media um, cry I think it's actually you know, kind of a cry for arms for us because it's it, it, it inevitably if someone's yelling out fake media, then you probably got them. Um, but I think it's it's given, I uh, said it before, given us renewed energy in mainstream media, like the likes of the New York Post and the, you know, the Washington, um, New York Times, Washington Post, you know, CNN. They've never been stronger um, um, in their in- influence on American politics. I'm keeping questions coming in. I've got one here from Ashia. Uh, she says, do you think Trump would still be polling so low had it not been for COVID? And do you think his handling of COVID has changed the minds of people, particularly in those swing states that went red last election? Uh, it's a really good question. And I think that if um, COVID hadn't come um, when it did, Donald Trump would have been every bit of chance to be well in front by now because the American economy was going very, very, very strongly. Um, and, and he runs on, on his economic platform that's been devastated, to be honest, by coronavirus. Do I think he's handled it properly? Um, no, clearly not. Um, he's more focused on his economic policy. Is it changing um, what the way people vote? Um, yeah, I think probably. I think they see that he has um, dismissed the concerns of people. And you remember the healthcare system in America is it's not good at the best of times. Um, and if you're poor, uh, and it's predominantly the poor that are dying, um, yeah, that's going to really change the minds of, of Americans. But I think I think that he's rusted on 
supporters haven't changed their mind. It's the, probably the people that would, would change the outcome of this election. The, the swing voters, if, the, if there are any left, would have probably changed their mind. And again, I go back to what I said earlier. We, we really don't know. Um, I, I think we're still not going to know election night. I think um, it's every chance that you might see Donald Trump well in front. Every chance you might see Donald Trump say things like, we're doing very well. It looks, going, it looks like it's going to work out for us because there's going to be, if not millions, tens of millions of postal votes that are going to come in. That's going to be the blue wave that could change the election, that could change from Donald Trump being in front on election night to being behind in the coming days. And guess what Trump, Donald Trump's going to say? What happened? Those postal votes, you know, there's fraud. Well, Tavlin um, Singh's actually got a question about that. Uh, mm. Donald Trump, as you were saying, has been repeatedly hinting that he may not accept defeat in this election. Mm -hmm. um, and with the outcome hard to predict uh, and Trump saying that he, he may not leave office, do you have mm -hmm. any idea how that would work if Trump lost and refused to leave the presidency? It's potentially going to be ugly. Um, let's talk about a legal point of view. And I, I, I hearken back for those who were listening in my first election uh, in, in 2000, that ended up in the Supreme Court, was predominantly a conservative court, voted five to four in favour of, um, of calling off the recount and, and, and that resulted in, in George W. Bush becoming president. we now got a conservative um, Supreme Court again. And that's why they're fighting so hard to get this Supreme Court uh, appointment through. Um, and you, you know that Donald Trump is right now, he's marshalling um, lawyers to head to those places that could end up um, deciding this election um, to bring in doubt um, the legit legitimacy of what's happening. You looked at Florida back in 2000, the, the election count was run by a Republican. Um, so these are the things you could, it, it, so many of these states are Republican swinging but democratically run. It, it, it's, it's just going to be a minefield. That's the, that's the legal side of it. But then you go back to um, his supporters and their threat of, perhaps using violence to make sure that he doesn't leave the White House. On the flip side of it, by the way, it could, it could go the other way if Joe Biden loses. So I, it's a really, someone said it's the most fraught situation since the Civil War. That may be an exaggeration, but there's certainly a, a lot of anger um, out there. Uh, Patrick's asked, in the case of a Biden victory, uh, what do you see for the future of the Republican Party? Will it continue to be dominated by Trumpisms? Yeah, I think it will because it's worked. And I think that the next person, <laughs> there's a theory that if Donald Trump loses, he'll come back in 2024 and contest again. Um, I think it's more likely to be Mike Pence. I think that, 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 that they know that their base is where tr Donald Trump has proven it to be, you know, these middle, um, this middle, middle-aged white, um, predominantly man, non-college educated, um, Midwestern, um, voter. Um, that's who he appeals to. That's that, that, that was the base that got him into the, the White House in 2016. And I, I think um, that's where they'll go again. And it'll depend on, of course, on how successful, if Joe Biden, Joe Biden is president, how successful his presidency is. Uh, Daniela's asked, Trump's use of language seems to be simplistic and repetitive. Um, is that an act dumbed down to his base supporters? Oh, I think it's partly that. I mean, he's certainly not the orator that, um, uh, that Barack Obama was. Um, I, I think that he, he knows he's a smart man. I, again, regardless of what you think of his politics, he knows how to hit the notes that his people want to, to listen to. Um, and he, he, you know, he knows he's not going to win over the Joe Biden vote. So he's, he's going to talk the language that that his, his base understands and agrees with. Um, so, uh, you know, he's not a great orator. There's, there's no question about that. He's no, nobody's fool and he has plenty of advice. And, I, and he is a maverick. He does shoot from the hip and that's what his base loves. It was interesting, the 2016 campaign, which you were over there covering, um, there was some clear 
a clear policy platform that Trump was running on. And he managed to deliver a lot of his promises, actually. Um, he tried to build the wall. He's built large mm-hmm. sections of it. America hasn't, mm-hmm. I mean, Mexico hasn't paid for it. So that's a bit mm-hmm. of a maybe. But on, on economic promises, he delivered tax reform. As you yep. said, the economy was going very well um, before COVID. I'm just wondering, we haven't got, you know, the build the wall and those kind of slogans. I haven't noticed them as much this campaign. Have you got a strong idea of what he's promising next term? Well, that's, that's the big question because he's being very short on what to expect in the second term. And, and you know, you, you say build the wall. Uh, I, I don't know that that much of the wall is being built. They're certainly not going to be shouting build the some wall anymore. Because they, yeah, yeah, I think some of it might have blown down. But, you know, I, I, think, I think that's probably left. He's trying to arc up the, you know, um, the jail Hillary jail, um, lock her, lock him up, lock her up kind of routine. Um, but he's been very short on details. And in, in some ways uh, it's understandable because they've got to fix the, got to fix the economy now. Um, they, 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 they seem to be happy just let coronavirus run its course um, and try to salvage the economy as best they can in the hope that perhaps a vaccine will be um, coming down the pipe soon. Um, I think that's what Donald Trump is um, concentrating on is, 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 the, is the economy um, and kind of pushing aside what's happening with COVID-19. And we've got a few minutes left, so please, if you have a question, get it into the Q&A and I'll try and get to ask Mike um, if he's got an important one. Mike, be honest, the coffee's better here, right? <laughs> I don't drink coffee, uh, so yeah, it's wasted on me. But yes, if you listen to my American That's wife, why you coffee can stay there so long. Definitely, <laughs> it's years it's definitely years. better. <laughs> yeah, no, she she would she would wholeheartedly um, agree with that. The coffee's better here. Uh, if there's people here today who one day they want to be a foreign correspondent, mm-hmm. what tips would you give them um, to get that job and to to do well when you're over there? You know, I got lucky. I don't know how I got the job, to be honest. Um, I, I kind of right place, right time. I, I'm the son of a newspaper uh, printer who started in regional um, newspapers, um, kind of bumbled my way through and kind of landed the job here at Channel 7 back in the late 90s. And I, I guess I just oh, I just worked hard. Um, I don't think any, there's any substitution for to just, to, just to work hard. And any time I had an opportunity... Um, I tried to make it work for myself, um, much like Ebony did, you know, and it, it took, even with greater results. Um, I, you know, I made my fair share of blues over the over the journey. Um, but I think, um, yeah, put your put your head down, your bum up, and and work and push hard. And you know, like they, those bureau jobs. Um, they're working 18, 20 hours a day. That's, that, that, that job seemed glamorous, but it's, it's bloody hard work. And sometimes, you know, um, sometimes there's a lot of fun and sometimes it's just bloody, you know, you know a grind. Uh, that's the truth of it. But what a wonderful gig. And if anybody ever gets the chance to, to do it, grab it with both, both hands and run with it. Um. I understand now back in Melbourne, you know, you're you're a bit of a leader in the newsroom and offer advice and and mentoring to to younger journos in the newsroom. I was just wondering, would you encourage someone to get into journalism? What what do you think is good about the job? Or do you think, you know, maybe they should look elsewhere? I think if you become a doctor, I'd recommend that. (laughs) Probably pays better. Um, No, I love my job. Yeah, um, and I would absolutely recommend it anybody getting into journalism. I honestly don't know where it's going. Um, and I'm a bit of a dinosaur. I it's kind of laugh. I, I left in the 90s as a young reporter. I've come back and I'm, I'm the kind of the salty veteran. I don't know how that happened, but that's true. Um, but I, I still have a great passion for, you know, trying to find the truth um, and, you know, cutting through the politics of which there is so much of it right now. There's so everything's bitterly divided, you know, this I stand with Dan and dictator Dan and, you know, trying to cut through all of that and find out what the truth is here. Um, uh, that's what makes me passionate and telling average people's stories. Um, I know it sounds cliche, but we often forget about 
the people who it affects the most and, um, you know, in the, in the messaging of those who are leading. Now, Mike, I know you're politi politically objective, um, but mm -hmm. there's another contest happening this Saturday, which <laughs> you've shown you <laughs> um, Tigers versus Geelong. You're a Tigers man. What do you think the grand final is going to be like at the Gabba this Saturday night? Oh, in fact, I had to change the background because it was Richmond. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I am not objective when it comes to Richmond. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I'm not. I, I, I hope we smash them. Um, I've lived through too many bad, lean years as a Richmond supporter, so um, I will be, I'll cop it if they don't because I open my big mouth all the time. But, no, I'm a passionate Richmond supporter. It's one of my joys. There we go. I've got uh, Laura, Laura saying go Tigers. I'm with you, Laura. What are you, it's gonna be, is it going to be weird for you watching it at night? From your lounge room or just with your family? Well, you've got to remember I spent 18 years in America watching it in the middle of the, you know, middle of the night, late at night, early in the morning. You could have missed 2017. My... Well, I did, come, I did actually come over for a weekend. I was, I was still in America. I flew back for three days and lucky enough to get to the grand final with my dad. But most of my football watching has been done on a, on a yeah, phone. Um, I watched one final in... Um, Argentina um, one year and only threw the, the phone out the window when they lost. So I, I'm, it's, I'm no stranger to watching Richmond. I, I'll take it win where it is, but I would love to have been there. I took my American son to last year's grand final and he complained that he was getting tired from celebrating too much, which, you know, I had to remind him that I'd had 37 year, lean years. Good, to, good thing to complain about. Well, I hope that's what uh, you and your son <laughs> can complain about on Saturday. Uh, thank you so much, Mike, for giving us your time and insights tonight. We'll be sending you a small gift from Drinks Trolley. We have a special offer for Melbourne Press Club guests. So if you go to drinkstrolley.com.au and use MPC10 at the checkout, you'll be able to get 10% off. Um, and thanks to Ebony Bowden, who took some time out on the campaign trail in Florida to have a chat to us and give you some of her insights into covering the 2020 campaign. Uh, the Copyright Agency Cultural Fund sponsors these events and they have been doing for a long time. Um, if you know anyone else who might be interested in sponsoring the Press Club, please get in touch. We're always open to suggestions. It's admin at melbournepressclub.com. Um, we're hoping to put together some tips and resources from what we've discussed tonight. So make sure you're on the mailing list or have us on Facebook We'll be sharing them shortly, as well as some of the highlights from the discussion on YouTube. I uh, really appreciate you joining in and watching. And for anyone who submitted a question, thank you. Sorry I wasn't able to get to all of them. Um, if you like what you saw tonight and you have the ability or, or feel like supporting the Press Club financially, we'd really appreciate it. Um, we're here to support Melbourne journalism and offer more of these things for you, hopefully in person very soon. Uh, it's donate.melbournepressclub.com. Um, thanks again for your time and hope to see you at our next event.